the executive director, recently, formerly uh, exhibitions director. So today I'm wearing more of my exhibition director. <laughs> so I first want to thank you for joining us today as we celebrate the opening of arriving at Berkeley. Uh, we will begin with the talk. After the talk, we will be doing uh, a reception where you'll have a chance to speak with the artists and curators further. So today, arriving at Berkeley celebrates the history, nature, and legacy of the Berkeley Arts and Crafts Colony and highlights the presence of a group of artists and craftsmen who have prospered as residents, visitors, students, and builders of Berkeley over the course of 120 years. Concurrently, the exhibition reveals the continued art and craft connection between Berkeley of yesterday and today. As I mentioned, I began with Berkeley um, last June, and I have had the great pleasure of working with the co-curators on this project during that time. So it is my great honor to introduce art historian Bruce Weber, and Henry Ford, who is um, Director Emeritus, our Berkeley historian and co-curator of this exhibition as well. So I am going to ask you to join me in thanking them, and I'm going to pass over the mic to Henry to begin our day. such a sky, a painterly sky, a transparent blue with wonderful gradations towards the horizon, and such beauty of cloud forms and a distant blue landscape as I never expected in New York City. The beauty of the landscape is very great. Ralph Radcliffe Whitehead, June 5th, 1902. It started. Within a month, he said, this is it, and the, the colony was starting to be built. So thank you, Ralph. We can survive. Yes? It's going to be loud. Can you can't hear me? No. Now? 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 Where's my tech support? <laughs> I talk very loud, so sometimes you don't even need a mic. Well, poor Michael, you know I talk loud. I can't help it. My, there's many thank yous. Um, the first is to the lenders uh, for the, the, um, the exhibition. Um, we could not have done it without you because it brought us from the middle years to what's happening in the, in the, in the decades today. Second, I'd like to, to thank Dr. Bruce Weber. Um, I'm introduced as the co-curator, co but he's got the threats, not me. Um, Ursula, Ursula Morgan, you know, she has just been, do you know she left here at 1025 last night? I know because I get alerted, so I know when somebody's leaving the building. Um, thank you, thank you for your expertise, your talent, and most importantly, the last few months, her patience. This has been a lot of heavy lifting with, with, with all of the discussion. I'd like to... I'd like to thank Catherine McNeil and the Woodstock Bertha Guild Board. Uh, thank you, Catherine. It was when the, the idea for this exhibition was pitched, it was that everyone said, yes, do it. Um, so thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, and I don't see his face here. Well, there's one, Doug. Thank you. Doug Milford, shout out for the lights. Thank you. He's, he's, there's two of 
There you are. You're just in time for your your shower. I, you know, without that gentleman standing there, there would be no permanent collection. He founded the permanent collection for the Woodstock Birthday Guild, and we are so fortunate that he started it, and it was a seed for more more artwork to be to be donated to Berkeley. It's it's his legacy, and we are very very fortunate. Thank you, Doug. And good to see you outside. Good to see you. <laughs> so, now I try to get first. Without a mic. Without a mic. Without a mic. The mic is working. The mic is working. The mic is working. The mic is working. Hello? Bob Dylan and uh, the, the 
Dignitas and, um, uh, and Bruce Dorfman. And then in the area that deals with uh, mostly artists who come here for residencies over time. So that gives you an idea of the layout of the show. Um, we didn't do a catalog for the exhibition, um, but there are extensive labels um, that you can read as you pass along. I also have a website for the Learning Woodstock Art Colony, and in November, I'm going to be putting up all the labels that are in the show, plus a little bit more extensive some of the artists. So you can learn about that. Harris was holding it up. So it was a decision on our part not to um, have our panelists have name tags. It's sort of like, what's my line? <laughs> so they're going to, so we, we really bridge the gap of, of the many generations and, and the magic of, of um, if we were up in the colony, there'd be no doubt that Jane would be standing behind me, floating around, saying, what are you doing here? Who are you? Uh, and God knows what Ralph would be up to. We're not going to but I mean, we're going to let each one, our wonderful panelists, kind of tell their story. Um, who they are, what years they were in, in Berkeley. I know, Rich, you're still here, you'll always be here, so don't worry, me too. <laughs> we'll be the last man standing. Um, so, Barbara, would you like to start? Sure. And also, this, this is a therapy rule. He who has the stick has the room and can talk. Okay. I'm pretty loud myself. But I'll use this because maybe it will help. Hello? How's that sound? Maybe I'm looking for something. You have to hold it very close to your mouth. Like this. Yeah. I'm Margaret Carlson, and I grew up on Glasgow Turnpike just on the edge of Birdland. And my family, John F. Carlson was my grandfather, and Harriet Goddard, who made that big blue turquoise urn was my great aunt. And her sister, Harriet's sister, married my grandfather. I recognize your face, I think. And so, it Bert had flowed through my veins. I mean, we were, as children, we were crawling all over Bertlip, and all our friends were up there. The whole Webster Stallforth clan was up there, and all those buildings were buildings where we grew up and played hide and seek and spent the night and had many, many meals and so forth. So Berkeley sort of um, was the air I breathed. My Aunt Harriet was not actually a formal Berkeley person who invited, you know, to join the colony in, in some sort of a formal sense by the Whiteheads. But the Whiteheads were at all the parties, along with my great aunts and my grandmother. And, and then as the elders died off, the parties continued, of course. And then my parents and that whole generation were present at all those parties. Am I being heard well enough? Yes. Okay. But I think the mic is off. Oh. <laughs> I think I off but you're still hearing me all right. Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> so it's great. I mean, I met Bruce a few years ago, first by the phone, and he had a question for me. A question. And that question multiplied, and multiplied, and multiplied. And he had great questions about Woodstock, the top topography, really, who lives where. And of course, since I grew up crawling all over this mountain in this town, I knew who lived where, and which creeks emptied where, and so forth. And so I was able to help him get the physical layout. You know, I guess we're still working on that in some way. The physical layout squared away. That map is tremendous. If you want to really dig into history, it goes back. That map is from 1930. Right. So I think I was supposed to talk for three to five minutes and give you a thumbnail sketch, and I think that might be it because I want to leave room for everybody else. <laughs> Questions welcome, of course, at some point. Thanks. Hi, my name's Robert Lucy. Um, my husband, Chris Wells, and I have lived in Birdcliff for now nine years. We moved here from New York City, and uh, before I moved, I didn't know anything about Birdcliff, and we discovered it as we moved here, and have had a really incredible chapter of our lives living here, and we live in Yggdrasil, uh, 
the name is the uh, refers to the tree of life in Nordic myth, and I think it's one of the most charming buildings in Birdcliff. Um, it's just below the barn in the, in the ceramics building. It's just below. And uh, I'm actually having an open studio tomorrow from <laughs> 1 to 4. And you're all welcome. And you get a chance to see one of the best cottages in Birdcliff. And I'll have a lot of my work up as, sort of, as we're moving out. We're leaving just after Halloween. So I've been clearing out everything else that we had and just putting up my work for a moment. And uh, it's been, I, I must say that living in Birdcliff has been one of the great joys of my life. I, I walk the loop road every single day as a break for my painting. And uh, I'm a full-time painter and I've been working in that studio now upstairs in Igrasil for nine years and I've created a, in, actually an incredible number of paintings that I would love to share with the ones that remain. Um, my painting is the, uh, the, the October Leaves that's there in the contemporary section. Um, before I moved to Birdcliff, I've had, you know, been painting for 35 years and my, my work in New York was much more sort of inspired by all advertising and graphic colors and I can see once I moved to Birdcliff, being in nature and being in this environment has been, had a huge effect on the subjects that I painted. I've become much more uh, into landscape and flowers and uh, more natural, natural color. And uh, it's, it's been a huge influence on me and my work. And it's been a huge sort of hard thing just to be living in a place that is dedicated to art where the whole it has this history and this and all of the artists that have been there for 120 years i can feel it you know and you feel it living there and being in that environment and it's just been uh, it's kind of like finding a home being able to be an artist who's sort of always felt a little bit outside to suddenly being in a community that is about art and about making art and about celebrating art and as a part of nature with the, with the, the founders who, uh, I know that Ralph Whitehead talked about, find, when he was finding the space for Birdcliff, he was, there was like an elevation that was supposed to be the best for creativity and Birdcliff was the perfect place. 1,200 feet. 1,200 feet. And uh, I think that after he died, uh, his wife Jane moved into Yggdrasil and I think lived there for many years. So it has a really, our, our specific cottage has a really interesting uh, history within the Birdcliff history itself. So anyway, thank you. It's nice, nice to be here. I appreciate being thank included. You. Thank you. I'll pass the unmarking. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's your show now. Oh, Go for it. Anyway, I'm Regina Cherry and uh, what I have to say is Oh, probably second hand. Mm -hmm. um, Herman Cherry, my late husband, uh, moved back to the west, to the east coast, from the west coast, in 1945, and his first place was in Woodstock at Birdcliff. And uh, he had reconnected with Philip Guston, whom he had known on the west coast in the 30s, and uh, shown him in a small gallery. And I think the mega fans were already here, mega fans and Bruce Curry. And he entered into a uh, fabulous artist community. Uh, he chaired the uh, Woodstock Artist Conference in 1947 and 1948. And a lot of artists came for that. He made lifetime friends with Dorothy Daner, uh, David Smith, Eric Ernst. They were all up here in the 40s for the conference. So after that, uh, he and his wife, Danny Winters, uh, lived in Birdcliff and uh, then got to, uh, to Paris on her living line and came back in 49, uh, 50. And the whole community was amazing. I met a lot of those people that were still alive in the 70s. Uh, Maureen Greenwood had already died, and Bob Haig was alive, Gladys Plate, Reggie Pollock. Joneses, Bromberg, who is still alive, Carl Fortas, uh, who owned that piece, and 
donated it to the field. That's an experiment with diesel hermit cherries from 45, 6 or something. So, and Eddie Millman was a dear friend. At this time, he wore his shoes. He died so early, unfortunately. He wore shoes for a long time. Uh, <laughs> fit his shoes. Uh, it was just a great community, and he came up later after him and then moved to, to the city. Uh, he came up for a lot of funerals, of gatherings, uh, and when Fletcher Martin died, another old pal from the West Coast who was here, uh, and they were all close friends. It was an amazing artist community. Once they uh, took you in, you just couldn't get away. <laughs> <laughs> Very supportive. So we would come up repeatedly up to Woodstock. And uh, one summer in 79, actually, we spent the whole summer in a barn, not a barn, a, a, a cinder block studio that he had built for the sculptor Abram Schlemowitz. And uh, we stayed one summer in there. Now, of course, nothing, no toilet, no water. He <laughs> came with a little cat and, uh, and the raccoons around. Now it's, it's, it's it's been a very important place uh, for Herman and for me. I don't know what else I can say. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can I sure. I'm Freya DeVito. My husband Ron DeVito is here, and he introduced me to Bird uh, to Woodstock. Uh, we met, I was 17, he was 20, at the Art Institute of Chicago, where he came to study for a year. After having studied <clears throat> in New York, he studied at uh, Queens College with John Farron. Uh, and he came up as a young boy with Bruce Dorfman when they were 16. He studied with Queen Yoshi and Dorfman had studied with Arnold Blanche, who was a teacher at the Art Students League. They actually lived right down the street here at Tenor and grew up in a little cottage. Uh, Ronald did the dishes in a diner, a, not a diner, a lunchroom that was right on the corner across Joshua's Cafe is what it became. And he also worked in um, the uh, uh, golf course. <laughs> And uh, they came up for that year, and he fell in love with the area. We then got married, and she lived in Chicago. We had a daughter, Emily, a son, Daniel, who are both in, in that painting. That's Ronald's painting of us in Birdwood. Now, our, our way of living in Birdwood was very different than most people's. We came up, uh, we were introduced not introduced personally by Bruce, but Bruce bought a piece of property on what they call Webster Road. I have known it as, historically, as the East Riding Road, and uh, we called Peter White and said that we'd like to buy a piece of property on that road. Well, he said, come on up, and we came up and we met with him, and he was charming. He was an absolutely charming man, and he loved us, and he said, you can have any piece of property I have ever been in. Well, we took the property right next to Bruce's. It was three plus acres, had a huge stream. And we bordered the property on the downside of Bob Dylan who lived above us. And we had the property below it, plus there was no house on it. Now, Ronald and I had done some carpentry together on the <laughs> old house that we lived in. That was his grandmother. Well, we designed a house, the likes of which you will not believe. <laughs> it's a 3,000 square foot of house, and the two of us built it. Yes, we had friends who did certain things, but we had the foundation put in because we were not re ready to do that. But it's a, it was a huge studio and a very large house. Well, during that time, uh, and that took us about four years, we bought the property from Peter three years before we moved to Woodstock. Ronald was working in the city. The kids were young. I was raising them. So uh, we came up here, and I held a variety of jobs down there as well. I was a nude model for uh, the local colleges down there. Um, and 
and, uh, and then we moved up here. And I wrote a little something here. We bought our property in 1964 from Peter, um, Webster Road. Um, we moved to a farmhouse when we came up, which was three, two years later actually, 1966 we came up, and we rented a house on Rock City Road just down from Henry Madsen's house on the corner of Glasgow and, and Rock City Road. And Henry loved my son. Oh, we adored him. He was so cute. He was a little blonde boy and he just loved him. Uh, Ron was, when we came here, we lived in that house for four years while we were started building the Birdcliff House. Well, of course, it was an enormous task for two people. We had some friends who were carpenters who would come up on the weekend and stay with us, and I would cook for them. I was, in the meantime, trying to start a restaurant with Mary Lou Petrell, who had the espresso, and we had the first pizza parlor, and we made cocoa van and pizza and all kinds of dinners and country pie. And we had like four full dinners, from hors d'oeuvres to dessert, a night for a set price, and people would come. And of course, Woodstock was changing then from what I considered to be a very visual world with painters, and it became a musical world, a world of rock and roll and noise and sound. And of course, being in Bearsville, the band used to come. I used to bake pies, fresh fruit pies. I baked eight a day. And they would call down and say, we want a cherry pie, or we want a whatever it was. And I baked them a fresh fruit pie. And so we did that while building the house. <laughs> and then we moved in while having the restaurant and working 18 hours a day at the restaurant. We had, um, we had this house, which was totally unfinished. But it had a roof on it, it had the windows in it, and we moved in. There was no bathroom, but thank God we had the restaurant because we had a kitchen. <laughs> and we finished the house. Also, my daughter Emily was an unusual young woman, as was my son. She graduated from high school at 14. She entered at 11 and then went off to Cornell and graduated at 17. So she was accelerated all the while we were living. Our lives were turmoil. It was wonderful. I also had a modeling agency. I worked for Deanies for a part time. I mean, we did everything. And Ronald painted full time. He was also a member of the Polari Gallery, where he had the only show Bud played had in Woodstock was with Ronald because he loved Ronald's work. And I was Bud's model. I modeled for all of the artists who live here. Yes, I, and you knew my daughter, I think. Yes, she went to school on the bus. I think she's now 62, so. I, I don't know, you may not have known. She's very young, she's a little kid. It's true. Well, I'm 84, so I, I know what that was. In any event, um, it was a wonderful experience. It was. Interesting as hell. People were. I, I wrote here the house was 3,000 square feet, two stories with an attic on top. We were still, we were still constructing it. Dylan, by the way, just lived above our new home and we shared a stream with him. It was an exciting and difficult time in Woodstock. During the six years we lived in Birdcliff, our home was open to everyone poets, painters, sculptures. Sculptors, musicians, con men, criminals, the rich, the famous, the impoverished, the insane, visionaries, charlatans, the political rebels, the methods disturbed, and the kind, the generous, the selfish, the cruel, and all and more were visitors. It was an incredibly lovely experience. We did leave the area. Um, it really was getting expensive in town. Taxes were going up. Ronald was selling work, but we weren't living well, uh, trying to live well. We decided that we would sell the house. We bought a, a farmhouse in West Shokan. The house was built in 
1721, and it had a three-story Dutch barn. We turned the barn into a studio, we redid the house, which was really a wonderful house, an old German couple had used it, and had copper gutters all throughout. It was really a wonderful house. We lived there for 50 some odd years. It was wonderful to live there, and we now live in Kingston, because I can't mow a 9 acre property anymore, <laughs> take care of that. But we painted, and we worked, and Ronald was still selling it, he's still doing drawings, paintings, all kinds of things. We live at the Lace Mill in Kingston, which is an artist-only housing. It's wonderful to live with artists, writers, painters, dancers, poets, musicians. That's what Woodstock was in its same day. I would hope that we could afford to get it to come back to that again in this area, because that was a legacy I was so sorry to have to move from. But it really, it was better for us as a family, but it was quite an experience. I did that stained glass piece, I did a variety of things. I sold several of them, many of them, from the guild. Uh, they had a, uh, a wonderful little store, and uh, you could sell work from it. I ran, also ran the Woodstock Artists Association, and I did that with Nancy Angela for years. So it's. I was very active, exhaustingly so, in those years, but it made me strong. Talk about 